Well, last week, <coughs> the Reverend Dan Carlson preached for us. He is a Lutheran ELCA pastor, and he preached on a couple of really hard texts, one from Jeremiah 23 and one from Luke's Gospel in chapter 12. And for those of you who weren't there, I'm going to do a really, really super quick recap because it's what leads into what I'm preaching about, what I'm preaching about today. The Jeremiah text begins really promisingly, and God is reassuring people that God is nearby, that God fills heaven and earth. That sounds like a good thing. And then it almost immediately goes downhill because God then says that God's power is like a raging fire, like a hammer breaking rocks into pieces. Doesn't sound much like the creator God who looks at creation and sees that everything's good and promises to love us always. And the Luke passage is even fiercer than that. Jesus in this passage is not telling stories. He's not healing people. He's trying to explain why he has come. And instead of saying the things Jesus usually says, like, do not be afraid, or lo, I am with you always, Jesus says this, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, rather than vision. And then he goes on in great and painful detail about all of these divisions between people that he has come to bring. Not really the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, of the Christmas story. And I have to admit, as I was listening to him preach, I thought, wow, those are really not the kind of texts that most of us liberal progressive UCC <laughs> pastors preach on. I mean, I have never, ever, until this morning, said anything about either of these texts. And if we do preach on them, as Dan pointed out last week, we kind of soften them up with, well, the kind of stuff Jeremiah was saying, that's just stuff prophets say, and, well, Jesus was just probably having a really bad day. <laughs> and as I went home and I was thinking about this and what I heard and kind of the feelings that came up for me as he was preaching, what struck me is how incredibly important are the images that we have of God of Christ, of the Holy One. And when I say images, I mean both the pictures we have in our heads about what they look like and also our kind of verbal, intellectual images of the Holy. And it struck me how disturbing those really fierce, fiery, violent images are because that's not the kind of God most of us want to be able to turn to when we're praying. And that is certainly not the kind of Jesus we want to go out and take nice spiritual walks with. We want a God who comforts us. We want a God we know loves us. We don't want to have a God who comes along with a sword in one hand and a flaming torch in the other hand and is preaching violence and division and conflict. Now, it's very important, and I want you to hear this part, in case you're making your grocery shopping list to get in here a sec. Dan had a really important reason for preaching on these texts, and he made a really powerful theological point. I'm not saying these texts should be ignored. In fact, I'm inspired to, I will preach on them again in the future. And if you didn't hear a sermon, you need to go on the internet and hear it. One of my takeaways was, I think it's safe to say that every single one of us has some fairly clear ideas, some fairly clear images about what God, about what Jesus, maybe even what the Holy Spirit looks like. I would guess most of us, if we grew up going to Sunday school and church, we learned all about this God who is love, this God who our teachers would tell us over and over is invisible cannot be described in human words. And then they'd show us pictures of what God looked like. <laughs> <laughs> and I particularly remember, I can't have been more than seven or eight years old, and we were hearing this story, Moses goes to Egypt and frees the Israelite people in slavery. And that gorgeous poetic passage, 
God leads them out, leads them with a pillar of fire by day and a cloud by night. And I remember being shown a picture of people in the desert and there's this big cloud and there's a God smiling face right in the middle of it. I remember learning about creation and how God enters into this space where there is nothing and usually there are pictures of God waving God's hands and then all of a sudden things appear and then God is sitting back with a really satisfied smile on God's face and I'll bet you all saw pictures of that too because that's what Sunday school teachers do is they want to help us understand this very mysterious being that they're talking about. I would also bet if you grew up in a Sunday school and church, you had pictures of Norwegian Jesus on the wall. <laughs> and by Norwegian Jesus, I mean that Jesus with the soft, blonde, curly hair, softly curly, not tight, but softly curly hair, blonde beard and bright blue eyes, and Jesus is usually pretty pretty tall kind of guy, although you couldn't tell it in the half pictures of him. And so we have Norwegian Jesus hanging all over our Sunday schools in church. And it usually isn't until a lot later, like maybe you were in high school, or maybe not even until we get to college, and we start learning more about Jesus and thinking more deeply about Jesus, and we realize that Jesus was Jewish. He was a Judean man who grew up in the part of the world we now call the Middle East. What we know about Judean men in that part of the world is that at the time is that they were actually relatively short. Jesus probably wasn't a whole lot taller than I am. <laughs> He had beautiful dark brown eyes and for a whole lot of us when we learned that it was no big deal we went oh well yeah I guess I had kind of a child's understanding of Jesus and and that was wrong and so Jesus isn't dark isn't blonde and blue-eyed and went on with whatever we were doing but for a lot of people their images of Christ, their images of God, their images of the Holy One are a very big deal indeed. They are images that they will fight literally to the death over. They will go toe to toe with other people over whether God is absolutely, positively, for sure, a shepherd or a mighty fortress or the king of all, or the great judge, or the beautiful poetic one in whom we live and move and have our being. One of the things I love most about the Bible is all the images it contains of God. And because it does, every single one of those people who has one of those particular images of God can go to the Bible and find a passage to back up their view. The Bible is rich with God images. And one of the things that is so interesting about the images that people have used for God over time, trying to describe that which is indescribable, is that the images that people use changed over time depending on what the people's circumstances were who were writing about God. And so back in some of the earliest texts when people were basically functioning in survival mode, they pictured God as a rock to shelter them from the sun. They pictured God as water, the key resource they needed to stay alive. And as humankind moved a little farther along its journey and they became herders, they had herds of sheep and goats. And you start seeing these images of God as shepherd. The 23rd Psalm comes from this time. The Lord is my shepherd, the shepherd who builds 
for their sheep, the shepherd who knows which sheep are his, and I'll come back to that in a second, which sheep belong to somebody else. And then as people became settled into townships and villages, and they needed to start developing a system of government, they started imaging God as the kind of ruler that they were hoping for in their communities. And on and on and on, different times and different contexts and different images. Right alongside those repeated affirmations that God is beyond human understanding. God does not fit into the categories we have for descri describing God. And so you end up with some exquisite poetry in the Bible, like that passage that Kelly read this morning from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. But there is no speech. There are no words, and yet their voice goes out through all the earth. What on earth does that tell us about God, except that God is mystery? God is inexplicable. God isn't in the same ballpark, the things that we are used to. And when it comes to pictures of Jesus, the same principles apply. We don't have as many pictures of Jesus because he's only described really in the four Gospels, although Paul talks about him in the letters. but. Really only descriptions in four chapters of the Bible, whereas God has 39 books in the Old Testament and then all of the other descriptions where God gets alluded to in the New Testament. But there are different images of Jesus. We see Jesus as teacher, and we see him as healer. We see him as challenger. We see him as the rebel from that text we heard last week and in lots more places. We seem to describe it in a number of different ways. So it's not terribly surprising that when the early Christian church got together to draft a definitive, clear description of who Jesus was, got together at something called the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, and they were trying to come up with a faith statement and a description of Jesus that all faithful people could claim and proclaim as true. What they came up with was this. Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Begotten of the Father before all eons. Light of light. Very God of very God. It's beautiful but it's not exactly crystal clear what it means. So you may be sitting there wondering, oh, like, and so what difference does it make what image we have of God, how I think about them, or how anybody else here, how anybody else out there thinks of them. And I want to argue, and, and fortunately there are loads of other pastors who would argue this too, and theologians and scholars and stuff, the images we have of the Holy One are incredibly important. They're important in terms of our relationships with other people, especially our relationships with people who may have a very different image or understanding of God from ours. And they are also deeply important because depending on the image of God that we have, we live and act in certain ways because we think that our God, that we understand the way that God is, wants us to do this and not do that. Our images of God inform things like how we eat and what we do with our trash, what kind of car we drive, who we vote for, how we raise our kids, the stories that we tell our grandchildren. They're tremendously important. And I'm going to talk about those separately because they're both fairly complicated. And I'm going to start with the issue of our relationships with other people because that's what often first comes to mind when you start thinking about, well, I know that God is really like this and my sister is clueless because she thinks that God is like that. And I put some really interesting research of a guy named Science Mike. Have any of you ever heard of Science Mike's blog? 
like I've been in the museum or gallery in ages, who really cares about all this art stuff, who does have to do with the real world. I want to invite you to think about <coughs> the last, doesn't even think about the last 30 years or the last 20 years, the last 10 years or the last two years, when you walk into this church or you walk into another UC church and you picked up our black new century hymnal. We keep calling it the new hymnal. It's been out for 30 years now. When the new hymnal came out, they had changed some of the images of God. They had taken some of the gendered images of God and made them gender neutral. And they had taken some of the militaristic images of God and taken them out for good theological reasons. And people in the pews were absolutely horrified and outraged by it. And it's bizarre, but when I do pulpit supply, every once in a while, people will say, still say, what do you think that stupid hymnal that UCC put out 30 <laughs> whole years ago? We are pretty attached to our musical images for God, too. Probably for the same kind of neurobiological reasons that we're attached to visual images. Now, this isn't just a matter of artistic preference or aesthetic temperament or even just sentimental attachments to images like sweet baby Jesus lying in the manger with all the cows and donkeys and everything all around, or our love of that powerful image of God sitting upon a mighty throne high above all the earth. Our images matter because they also tell us about our relationship to the holy. How are we like this image of God? How are we different from this image of God? What does it mean in our identity? If I call myself a child of God, well, like how much and how empowering is it to find images of the holy that you can identify with and then you can relate to? The second reason I said why our images matter is because they tell us how we're supposed to live. They suggest what the Holy One wants from us. Part and parcel of our image of God of Jesus is what God or Jesus wants or expects from us as we live. So if, for example, a person's image of God, and I, and I use this as someone who was very close to me at one time, her image of God was that God was a jealous God. And this jealous God would send anyone to hell who did not believe in Jesus. Now, if that's your understanding, I'm not saying that's a wrong understanding. I'm saying if that's your understanding of God, then what people are called to do is go out and evangelize. We know that missionaries have done horrible things to native peoples, but they did it with the very best of intentions. They were trying to save people's souls. If your image of God is, is that Jesus is always preaching about caring for the poor and reaching out and loving the marginalized, then what you're going to think that God expects from you is to do mission and outreach kinds of things, stuff like, you know, bringing baby food and baby supplies to go down to Ayan Kong, where migrant families needed them so badly, or bringing in food for the community food bank every week so hungry people can eat. Start paying attention to this, and you will notice that one of the major things that distinguishes different denominations and different faith traditions from each other is the peace of God, the peace of God's word, the specific image of God that is most important to them, that is most compelling, that they devote their energies to promoting in the world. And given that, it might seem like it's kind of important for us to have the right image you know, the correct image of God. So is pastor going to tell us? Preach it, pastor. And pastor can't do it because it's too complicated. 
because this isn't a question that has a single best answer. We want to know. We struggle, and so I think maybe the best thing we can do is we look for the image or images of God, of Christ, that are the most prevalent. I was a statistician once. That's what you do. You count stuff. So if you go through it, you count how many times God's a shepherd, God's a rock, and God is love. That Christ's a healer, Christ's a teacher, Christ is love. That's the image you come back to over and over and over again. The Holy One is love and calls us to be loving too. So I really encourage you. Not only do I want you to go out and fill people's buckets this week still, I want you to think this week about what are the images of God, of Christ, that you hold most closely to your heart? And what do they tell you to do? And what is the Christ life, the God-like response when we bump into one of those people whose understanding is really different from ours? To use Jesus' language, the question is who, what, will we follow? Amen.